thank you all for coming. It, it was uh, it's a very rainy day, so the students want to go back home. And so those of you who came, thank you very much. So this is a very uh, interesting topic, China and Latin America. Both continents, if we can say like that, are very far away. It's only the Pacific in the middle, but the Pacific seems to be a very important, uh, a very important, uh, a very obstacle to, for the trade and the uh, investments. However, since many centuries ago, China and Latin America have been trading. So during 250 years, between 1565 and 1815, trade between Latin America and Asia flourished. So it's not something from now. It was long, long ago. So then uh, when my ancestors are from Spain dominated Latin America, they favored this trade. So then porcelain, gunpowder, the agricultural products and animals from China and other parts of Asia would go through Philippines with the so-called Manila galleons to the east coast of Mexico. At that time, the name was New Spain. They would arrive in Acapulco, and then as much as a third of the silver extracted in Mexico would go back to Asia, mainly to China. At that time already, there were complaints that China was only interested in commodities and China was exporting manufacturing products. So the complaints are not new. Some of this trade would cross Mexico by mule and then go to Europe. But quite a, quite a bit would stay in America. Of course, 200 years later, we are in another era, in an era that China has taken all of us by surprise and Latin American commodities were very important for China. So behind what was called the golden era, the golden decade in the year 2000 in Latin America was, of course, the high commodity prices and was, of course, behind the demand from China. So since the year 2000, the demand from China was tremendous and China started being interested in Latin America for three reasons. One, because of the commodities. Two, because strangely enough, and very few people know about it, the, one of the first um, major investments of Chinese companies, the major investments happen, happened first in Asia, but then in Latin America. Huawei, for instance, one of the most admired companies in, uh, in China and, and beyond, a very innovative company, a provider of telecom equipment. So this company that, uh, that faces quite a bit of regulatory scrutiny here in the US, so how they enter Latin America? So it was around 2002, 2003, and they started conversations with Telefonica, one of the two most dominant telecom operators in the whole region, and they went to Telefonica and they said, why don't you try our products? And Telefonica was, of course, worried to use them in Europe, but they started using them in Latin America in a massive way. Then American Mobile followed and was one, uh, Huawei had started the internationalization earlier, but was one milestone for Huawei. So second, la, uh, Latin America has been used by Chinese companies as a way of experimenting. Chinese companies, that is the, 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 our, in our report that we published last uh, October, shows that Chinese companies are prevalent all over the world, but the way of internationalizing very often is on the side. So even Huawei started the product not in Beijing or in Shanghai, where you had Cisco, but in the periphery of China. They expanded in Asia and uh, and then Latin America. Latin America, in Latin America, they compete with products from all over the world and, uh, and then can try and see, try and see, learn and change. So the first thing, number one, is to for natural resources. Number two, as a way of learning and numbers in learning to compete as well. And number three, as a way to, of course, becoming much bigger in a way that is not, if you compete, first of all, in, in Europe or, or in the US, you are faced with tremendous scrutiny. So it's a way to try before, under the radar. 
that's a very interesting point. So as I said, 200 years later, from that, that first flourished uh, times of trade, so the trade between 2000 and 2015 has become tremendous for Latin America. So Latin America became the most important trading partner of Brazil, Peru, Chile, and number two in the whole continent, right after the US. So very important trade partner. And then we are now in the new era. I mentioned how uh, Chinese companies expanded in Latin America. So now in this new era, they are becoming investors. So Brazil represents 40% of the whole uh, South America, so the economy of Brazil. So now China is the most important investor in Brazil. Companies like State Grid, the second biggest company in the world by revenues, the electricity company State On from China, has made extreme, very big inroads in Brazil. So that, that's the third phase. So how can we view this uh, exchange, trade and investment between China and Latin America? The first one, the first aspect is asymmetry. While for Latin America, China is very important, it's not the same the other way around. There is not a single country in Latin America among the 10 biggest countries where they invest China. So as a region, yes, it's important. As a single country, not that important. So asymmetry. Asymmetry in that aspect. But the second asymmetry is that China has a very well thought strategy in Latin America. While Latin America, if we look at the investments and the trade, so the exports from Latin America to China, is bits and pieces here and there, trial and error not a very clear strategy. So that's another thing. So another aspect that is very interesting and has been studied by quite a few experts is the concept of risk. So if we look at the loans, so I said trade, investment, but also there are many loans. Uh, China has given more loans to uh, Latin America than the traditional lenders, like the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, the CAC. So China lends more money to Latin America than all these three multilaterals, all these three Western multilaterals together. So if we look at the loans, 50% go to Venezuela, who would have thought. So definitely a completely different perception of risk, another thing. Then another thing is that before the analysis was that China was closer to more left-wing governments in Latin America. We are seeing now that this is not true because, yes, China was close to Argentina when Christina Kirchner was president, but now with the change of government, a few months after, after uh, uh, President Macri took over in Argentina, China gave the next loan to uh, Argentina. So yes, blind to uh, different left or right uh, so risk. So asymmetry. Lack of, uh, lack of, um, what is it? <laughs> so asymmetry, the risk, a completely different uh, from risk. And then I wanted to address the last point, that is what is happening after the new US administration. The, the short answer, I've been given uh, presentations about this subject in Mexi Mexico and other places, and my first answer is that it's too early to tell. Of course, of course. And now, uh, the, 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 before the candidate, uh, Donald Trump, was very belligerent against Mexico and China to a certain extent. The attitude towards China has changed. The uh, attitude towards Mexico seems to be, in the last week, a little bit more calm. So I think it's too early. But yes, what we see is that NAFTA will be renegotiated. So what does Mexico uh, would like? What are, uh, what are the wishes from Mexico? So I think, it, okay, a positive thing has been NAFTA is more than 20 years old. 20 years old? Mm -hmm. So NAFTA is more than 20 years old. So of course, time for renegotiation from both parts. So yes, in Mexico, it's also the feeling 
that NAFTA should be renegotiated. What Mexico would like is a rapid end to this renegotiation and the uncertainty disappears. And of course, the, the, the Mexican peso that first lost a lot of ground has been recovering it, went down to 23, now it's 18, 19, so that means that things have come down and the NAFTA will be renegotiated. And we hope that the belligerent and sometimes very derogatory, very derogatory um, speeches against Mexicans are calmer. And, uh, and, and I'm from Spain, as I said before, and El País, that is the most important newspaper, have had for months on the cover page complaints about that. So it's not only Mexico, it's Latin America, it's the Spanish-speaking countries that are taking sides with Mexico and they don't want this type of rhetoric that hopefully will go down. So the second thing is that, uh, is that not only NAFTA is going to re be renegotiated, but the TPP, and here is where it comes, China. I was at the World Economic Forum when the first time this last January, President Xi came and came to say, yes, we are in favor of globalization. Yes, we are ready to occupy that space that the U.S. says, again, I said this is too early to say, but the U.S. is saying that it's going to withdraw from the pivotal uh, role that was, has been occupying forever. So definitely, definitely China is ready to occupy that. And as such, what has done very quickly is that the famous TPP that China was very much against the TPP because was seeing the, uh, the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership as a way for the U.S. to have a more important role in trade, not only negotiations, but trade also conditions in Asia and isolate China. So, of course, China was very happy when President Trump said, we are going to withdraw from the TPP, and yes, attended the meeting organized by Chile in Viña del Mar recently, in the, in last month. So then, yes, again, too early to say, but yes, if the U.S. withdraws, as the new president has said, that is going to withdraw, China is ready to, uh, to occupy that space uh, for a number of initiatives that mainly are centered in China, in, uh, in Asia, but also we see that Latin America is playing a role. And last but not least, I think we, we shouldn't underestimate that uh, China has been uh, looking very closely at the tremendous privatization wave of the 90s in, um, in Latin America. It has extracted a number of learnings from that, has studied delegations of the Central Bank of China have been visiting Argentina for, for years, trying to understand better what happened with the unpaying of the peso to the dollar. So yes, China, another thing that is learning from Latin America is not to do. Um, good evening and thank you very much, Darren, for organizing this. and. For those of you who are here, thank you for coming. Um, we hope there are more online. It's uh, coming from DC. I think the only reason it's thin on the ground today is in DC the weather's better. So mm -hmm. there's just a few of all fields. Um, I um, want to basically speak uh, to three points. And in a way, Lourdes has already covered much of the first one, which is uh, the primary form of analysis that is, is often used to describe the China Latin America relationship tends to be economic data. And it's obviously tempting. It's easier to observe, it's easier to measure, although there are many contradictory measurements, but there are certainly some strong figures. And Lourdes has mentioned many of them, but I will just throw in there uh, to put numbers out there the, the trade volume, bilateral trade volume between China and Latin America stands at about $240 billion annually, and that has stagnated more or less, even gone down a little over the last couple of years. And that's mainly because. Uh, the, the value of goods, the commodities uh, prices have, have uh, dropped, and that, of course, even if volume actually rises, shipping containers uh, traveling across the Pacific, the the actual trade volume in, measured in dollars has stagnated or dropped. Um, and still, Beijing announced uh, just two, about two years ago that they would um, that they strive to raise the total trade volume, bilateral trade volume, to 500 billion, double it. Mm -hmm over the next uh, six to ten years, and that 
may be difficult, but clearly there's a strong ambition and there are plenty of uh, needs on either side to make that uh, possible. Then um, we've also heard China has become a conspicuous lender um, to Latin America. And that, again, has been widely reported. Um, there was a tendency for some, you referred to this for a long time, to associate this directly with the political leanings of the country. But there are also papers, one by uh, a German scholar, Stefan Muno, um, who uh, specifically disproved through some methodology that it is linked to political ideology and to authoritarian systems. It's, of course, tempting to interpret it that way. And many US scholars have done that to say, well, it's obvious that it's easier to get direct access to certain government um, uh, you know, leading figures, and then it trickles down, and there is an easier command structure. But that isn't necessarily um, what's happening. And your example with Argentina kind of shows it, and also we see Brazil. Um, so there are many tendencies that go, um, that go hand in hand, um, and sometimes even contradict each other. Then there's the overseas foreign direct investment. And that's a bit tricky because we have all sorts of mechanisms that mess up the, um, or make complicated the analysis. So you get uh, not just direct investment, but uh, the tax havens and round tripping. And there are many um, incongruent sources. There's all the reinvestment, which is a whole school of itself, how to measure what Huawei, you mentioned, was, was in there very early, a private company, and of course has uh, Lenovo, Lenovo Holdings, uh, I found more by chance, uh, has been investing, you know, associate Lenovo with computers. But they also, Lenovo Holdings invests in grape um, plantations um, in Chile. So it's not, or cherry plantations. So, you know, it's not your obvious um, route, and there are many uh, things happening in parallel. Um, but I, either way, it tends to dominate the analysis. So my second point, and as a sinologist and political scientist, I'm sort of try to um, look primarily at what the cultural and political um, uh, uh, offensive strategies by China are and how Latin America responds. Um, and again, one can uh, find easy ones like the Confucius Institutes. You can measure the, how many Confucius Institutes there are and how many Confucius uh, programs and how many scholarships. Um, but this is where it becomes interesting because China has recently um, focused on that, um, given, given uh, stress that other dimensions, those other dimensions quite prominent. Uh, if any of you are interested in the subject in more depth, you can read the, um, the November 2016 Chinese policy paper for Latin America. And that spells out a very, in a very structured way um, that they want to uh, cooperate with Latin America on governance experience, um, intergovernment dialogue, political par exchange of political parties, um, which they've been doing for decades inviting all political parties across the spectrum. You know, in Venezuela, they've been speaking to the opposition, and so they try to spread their bets um, and have exchanges at the government, national government, provincial, and local levels. Um, and it's quite interesting to observe a charm offensive. I happen to have a friend on Facebook who works at the Chinese embassy in Bogota, and the new ambassador is the first one in, in a string of 10 who doesn't speak Spanish. Or fluent, he, he, he speaks German fluent instead. But he has been on a really uh, very visible charm offensive, speaking to every single governor in Colombia, traveling around, shaking hands, uh, making himself basically a familiar face. And that in the face of adversity, because Colombia is a country where there have been demonstrations against Chinese traders. And so there's uh, some tensions there and, and a certain element of xenophobia. So there are some real efforts, um, informal, you could say, but that are really trying to. The, lay the ground for future contracts, possibly in negotiations and just more openness. And, and the, the, the policy paper goes on to mention also HR uh, training, uh, exchange of think tanks, and they just had the third think tank forum in Beijing of China Latin America think tanks, and, and uh, exchange of youth groups, uh, exchange of media experience, which of course is again a very touchy subject um, when China um, you know, offers to um, train media uh, journalists, basically, um, from Latin America. But it's um, nonetheless something for mutual learning. Um, and then there is the, um, the something Li Keqiang, the prime minister, has mentioned um, on his trip to, to Latin America, which is the 1 plus 3 plus 6. Maybe you've heard of that. That's, again, a, a wonderful sort of uh, way simplifying, trying to boil down a complex program into certain structures. One is a plan, three, the three are three engines, trade, investment, and financial cooperation. And then there is in six fields. And again, we, we, these lists are um, on paper, but 
that Chinese uh, uh, government tends to be very good at following through and encourages its provincial governments to follow through, um, especially big provinces like Shandong and, and, and Guang, uh, Guangzhou, um, uh, Guangdong, um, to um, focus on energy infrastructure, agriculture, manufacturing, scientific and technical uh, technological information, and IT. So these are elements that, of course, are used to different degrees. But now come, I come to my third point, basically, which is uh, when it becomes really complicated, and that's why I find it the most interesting in a way, um, is looking at uh, non-state actors. So we have uh, something that, it's, it's obviously a shorthand that we use, you know, economists use, uh, political scientists use, to speak of China and Argentina, China, Brazil, um, China, Peru, and that is uh, certainly valuable, um, and it needs to be done, as it'll make sense, but ultimately, if you look uh, in more detail, there isn't such control, and there's even some observers think that there is, it goes the other way around sometimes, that it's a company that says, I want to go abroad, uh, government in Beijing, you need to back me, you need to provide certain guarantees, uh, certain securities, um, and behind the scenes, all sorts of negotiations go on, so that's when... Um, I encourage anyone who studies this to sort of look at these uh, these very um, diverse um, levels at which this is happening. And I actually wrote a, a chapter in a, a book recently, The Political Economy of China and Latin America, and that's when I try to speak of one actor, many agents, which is basically many, many agents. The, 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 the ambassador is a, is a more visible one, the Chinese ambassador in Bogota, um, who, who happens to, you know, like the cameras. And so he goes and, and has um, these very positive exchanges. But there are many others that are more subtle, that there are lots of um, exchanges going on at an informal level. Um, and um, I, one, one interesting uh, sort of dilemma that you find between China and Latin America relations, something I studied uh, in Peru specifically, I had the good fortune of speaking with Alan Garcia, who was previously president of um, and twice of Peru, and at the time wanted to run a third time. He has failed. But, um, in he, when I mentioned to him that the Chinese were having trouble with certain investments in certain areas and trying to get the local communities to um, pull, pull through on their uh, on lots they'd acquired to, to actually develop them and uh, dig up, um, uh, to do the drillings and so on, he said, "Don't worry, we'll deal with it. We'll we'll help. We'll help out." And he has been known to use armed, armed forces to basically um, impose a central government force in outlying areas. But by contrast, uh, I spoke with Gong Bensai, who at the time was the head of the CMPC in Peru, Sapet, um, and the CEO there. And he um, told of how they went to the north of the country, where they had bought a lot, um, and the local people demonstrated and didn't want uh, this to happen, didn't want the oil to be drilled out of the ground there. And they withdrew, and they haven't done anything. So there you have, in fact, a Chinese uh, company deciding, well, we may own it, but we're now going to you know, give it some time. Um, whereas the local government, uh, we call them the local elites, are in fact pushing for exploitation uh, of commodities uh, in all areas, uh, in the, even in the face of their, you know, their local populations not wanting to uh, go along with that. So um, that's um, something I feel is important to contrast uh, and makes the picture, whole picture more colorful. And just recently, I was speaking to some activists from Argentina and Peru who, you know, are worried about the Chinese uh, investment in everything from infrastructure to, um, to mining. Um, and they uh, even have the feeling that just because a company is owned by Chinese, most of the staff still remains local. So a lot of the issues that you found um, of uh, when there was a Canadian company in Colombia, uh, now suing the Colombian government for loss of profits, um, you will find that the, the staff, if a company is taken over by Chinese, the owners, the stock may be Chinese, but most of the um, people working there still will stick to the same, um, often uh, same roles, same uh, ig ignorance of certain regulations and not paying full attention to uh, social um, and environmental standards. So it's, it's quite complicated to analyze case by case, and I find that maybe the most enriching. So. Um, maybe to sort of wrap up, um, I just want to, and I hope there will be questions from, from you here. Um, the real um, easy measurement is, of course, measuring the, the national totals between China and different countries in, the, in Latin America. 
Um, but it's easy to generalize and is in some ways in inadequate, and therefore I find it very important to uh, look at individual case studies and uh, look at the dynamics that happen beyond uh, numbers. Um, and what I found particularly um, interesting from what Lourdes was saying, uh, quite rightly, you know, that we dare not really predict what the what this new administration, the Trump administration, means in this relationship because, uh, you know, after 2008, the economists gave up predictions because they realized that they couldn't, they didn't predict the financial crisis. Now, political scientists are also giving up predictions um, because it's too risky and too dangerous to really know what's going to happen next. Um, but uh, th there is certainly a sense um, in Latin America that there is um, those who've already engaged with China well, like Brazil and Peru especially, feel that now they have built a certain good, uh, done the first, laid the groundwork for building on that and having better, uh, more alternatives if the U.S. really pulls through on this sort of um, closing off or at least um, turning its back on its, its immediate neighborhood. So I'll leave it there and um, we'll talk some more soon. Acknowledgement. Uh, first, um, my dissertation was on uh, China-Latin American relations, which was done in the late 1980s, early 1990s, uh, under the guidance of Professor William Gillet. Yeah, I appreciate that. And Fulbright uh, sponsored me two trips to Taiwan, to mainland China, to study <coughs> the Chinese perspective on Latin America. Uh, of course, <clears throat> I appreciate the Cornell University invite me to have a talk here. And my son also <clears throat> was hosting at Cornell for one semester as Katrina Gates. <clears throat> okay, data. Uh, basically, <clears throat> my paper is different from uh, the previous presenters. So I'm looking at what Chinese think, not what Chinese do in Latin America. So I basically read the Chinese perspective. <clears throat> My talk will be focused on three points, trade, TPP, and Taiwan. Uh, trade or economic diplomacy is very important for China. So, but uh, in other American, the people might argue that Chinese have this kind of perspective, ambition, whatever. <clears throat> but most of the Chinese scholars argue that uh, China is leaned to both sides. Uh, China is working with uh, both so-called left-wing regime and also market-friendly government at the same time, not only for this year is even from 1960s. Okay, and China have a long-range plan. Some people might argue that China is losing a lot of money in Venezuela, in Brazil, maybe every project. Uh, but unlike the private sector or multinational in the United States, usually we have one-year plan, maybe three years maximum. If you're losing money, you withdraw. But Chinese have a long-range plan. If you want to stay in one country, they will stay there 10 years, even 20 years. Uh, theoretically, Chinese argue that uh, there's a win-win situation. The relations between China and Latin America is beneficial to both sides. Uh, but in reality, China have the ambition. Uh, if you're looking at what's going on uh, before China started, Market-oriented reform in 1970s, China basically was a periphery country. Uh, Semi-periphery, I would say, maybe uh, 2001, China became a member of WTO, till maybe 2025. China has a plan which is called 2025. That's an industrial upgrading. China chart out 300 billion plan, which China launched in 2015 to become a leader in 10 strategic sectors, ranging from computer chips, electronic cars, airplanes, pharmaceuticals, you name that. 
And if, if you look in the trade, and the Chinese scholar have a debate on that. When I conduct my dissertation in the late 1980s, uh, the bilateral trade between or two-way trade between China and Latin America, uh, between China and Latin America was three billion. Uh, in recent years, 240 billion. So since I wrote my dissertation, that's increased 80 times. Uh, more recently, some scholars argue that since year 2000 till maybe 2016, uh, China's two-way trade with Latin America increased 20 times. At the same time, the US trade with Latin America increased only double. So China is well ahead of the United States in terms of speed. And Latin America is not alone. China have more trade with European countries, with Asian countries, even with Africa. So, so Chinese scholars argue that it's not uh, political ambition to sabotage the United States in the backyard of the United States. Again, some scholars argue that uh, about two years ago, Chinese argued that we'll redouble the Chinese trade with Latin America from 250 to 500 billion. In terms of investment, uh, we we'll double as well. But on the other hand, many scholars disagree on that because the Chinese economy has entered a period of new normal. In the past, uh, China's GDP growth may be more than double digit. But in recent years, it basically is 6 to 7%. And China also tried to um, change its strategy from so-called export-led economic model uh, to consumer-oriented economy, focusing on domestic needs rather than dumping goods to other countries. Uh, of course, inflation is on the run, and that defaults is a major problem China is facing today. Another worry of China is, in China, the people talking about Latin Americanization of China, uh, political theory, or especially economic theory, argue that when country um, reach a certain level of GDP, let's assume that it's 6,000, then that country stagnates. Uh, for instance, Argentina, 100 years ago, Argentina used top seven most industrialized or richest country on earth. Argentina today is not in that good shape. Of course, Chinese also study Latin America to say, yes, there are some exceptions. For instance, Chile, Mexico, they are the member of OECD. So China tried to learn the experience of Latin America. The Chinese scholar argue that if you're looking at the trade, it's a basically a complementarity. It's not a new colonialism. In the West, we say, yes, the Chinese try to exploit Latin America just like Spaniard did, just like the American did. But Chinese argue that uh, there's a comparative advantage. Uh, China has a comparative advantage of producing low-cost manufacturing products. Uh, especially in recent years, there's overcapacity of construction that China had a lot of steel, cement, construction material, glasses to export to other countries. Uh, China is not a country that is rich in resources. China does not have sufficient resources, uh, no matter what natural resources you name off. Uh, from soybean uh, to iron ore. So Latin America is the ideal place for China to trade and to invest. And the, in Chinese mind, Latin America, there's a lack of infrastructure. But Chinese are quite good at building bridges, tall buildings. So China argued that it's a win-win situation if Latin America and China cooperate and everybody benefit. 
And the Chinese also hoping that in the future, Latin America, for instance, Brazil and Argentina could export soy sauce bean instead of soy. Right, it's a high processed goods. And steel products instead of iron ore. Since pollution is very high in China, it's, it's time for Chinese government to reduce the pollution of smog. In general, Chinese scholars argue that um, if Latin America and China cooperate, and they can all benefit. My second point is TPP. Two years ago, when I was in China, Chinese scholars are very worried about TPP. Because they believe TPP was the core of Obama's rebalance or pivot to Asia. Uh, and Obama does not want China to write a rule for global trade. Uh, but we all know that since uh, President Donald Trump came to White House, uh, TPP is out of picture. So nowadays, in Latin America, in China, is talking about the TPP minus one. That means the United States is not part of that. But the question is that there is a vacancy in TPP. Is China interested in the job? On one hand, the Chinese are very, very happy about that. Since Obama's, <laughs> let me say, uh, people to Asia is basically gone. But some other Chinese scholars argue that rebellion to China is not gone. Maybe it's gone in rhetoric, but not in deeds. <laughs> Uh, for TPP, China was invited to attend a meeting in Chile last, uh, last March. So we can see that uh, China is interested, but China is more interested in the so-called RECP. That's a Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. That's China-led regional economic development regime in Asia. China is more interested in the one belt, one road, which is again a China-led process. In social media, the Chinese common people are very happy, excited about China was invited to attend the TPP. Um, but Chinese also argue that China cannot carry Latin American economy. Economically, the United States is much more important. And the United States consider Latin America is a backyard of Latin America. China does not want to challenge the United States in Latin America at this moment, according to the Chinese scholar. And some Chinese scholars argue that uh, TPP is not in the national interest for China to be a leader. And China had very little to gain from filling any gaps America might leave in TPP. Of course, Chinese scholars' suggestions are not always taken, but Beijing is willing to hear that. Now, the official perspective. The Chinese foreign ministry argued that that's not a TPP meeting, but it's just a high-level dialogue on integration initiative in Asia Pacific, challenge and opportunity. Beijing claimed that Beijing's position towards TPP has not changed. So it looks like Chinese government officials are not very interested at this moment. On the other hand, there's a domestic constraint. The Chinese economy slowed down, there's financial crisis, externally, uh, China has its hands full. China has a problem with Japan, East China Sea. China has a problem with Vietnam, <laughs> Philippines, South China Sea. And China also has its ambition, which is focusing on Asia, Africa, and Euro European countries, which is called One Belt, One 
road. So Latin America is on a very low priority of the Chinese government. Okay. So in short, China will participate if invited to any TPP forum, but in the short run, uh, it's unlikely China will uh, join the TPP. And the TPP is also very high standard, and China does not think it has the so-called Okay, my last point is Taiwan. Um, for China, maybe for Latin America, Taiwan is not that important. Maybe many people in Latin America doesn't know the difference between Taiwan and mainland China. But in China, uh, that's the core interest. Uh, partially because Taiwan nowadays have 21 diplomatic relations, uh, 12 of them are in Latin America. And that's another reason China spends so much effort in Latin America. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.